I sense a couple of themes bubbling up through the homilies over these past few weeks and from today, the Feast of the Epiphany, they seem to tie together. One is that Jesus comes to us in the messiness of life. And in that mess, he offers a great gift of hope. And in that, there is a holy exchange of gifts. So over the past two weeks from this pulpit, we've talked about the reality of the nativity versus the romanticized version. We've kind of set the record straight. Jesus was born in a cave, a place of protection for farm animals. And farm animals are large and messy and smelly. Jesus was born in the messiest, smelliest place on the planet. And today the Magi encounter Jesus, the King of Kings, in a humble home about six miles from Jerusalem, in a tiny backwater village. Following the star from the east, they make a stop in Jerusalem and engage with King Herod, a puppet king of the Roman Empire, not a real king. That's why he lived in such fear. Whenever we serve anyone but the king of kings, we're always afraid because everything can be taken from us in a second. Herod lived in a palace. Archaeologists tell us that it was the second largest building in the great city of Jerusalem, second only to the temple. Walls 16 feet high with two main buildings, and in each building there were banquet halls and accommodations for hundreds of guests. The Magi leave the great city of Jerusalem, home to about 40,000 people, and they encounter the one true king, Jesus, who feared nothing. They encounter him in Bethlehem, a tiny village of about 300 people, as the star comes to rest over a humble home. Lying in a food box for animals and our king of kings reception of the magi in the humblest of, humblest of homes is no accident. God does nothing by accident. Jesus comes to us in the humblest and messiest places and he meets us there because he wants to share life with you and me, and our lives are so messy. Oh, so messy. And many of the times, most of the time, I'm responsible for that mess. I want you to keep that thought in mind as I gently shift gears to recall those hope-filled words from the prophet in today's first reading from Isaiah. Rise in splendor. The Lord's glory shines on you. The nations will walk by your light. They will all come. What's so interesting to me about these prophetic words is the time and the context, the backdrop of when they were written. The Jewish people we're just returning to Jerusalem from 60 years in exile. Exile in Babylon after they were conquered by the Babylonians because they disobeyed God and they didn't trust their God. And after 60 years, Cyrus, the Persian king, comes and he conquers Babylon and he frees the Jews to go back to their homeland. Babylon was about 900 miles from Jerusalem. It was a trip that took about four months. And I imagine that after 60 years, that four months was spent in incredible anticipation. Imagine after that journey, they come to that hilltop and they finally look out and see their city and their temple in ruins. That's 
when those prophetic, hope-filled words were spoken by the prophet. What incredible disappointment and remorse they must have felt knowing that the destruction that their eyes behold was a result of their actions, a result of their decisions. And we know that feeling, don't we? It's that moment that we come face to face with the destruction that we've caused with our words or something that we've done, the hurt, wounded relationships that are left in the wake of those words or actions. It's that epiphany moment when we say to ourselves, what have I done? What a mess I have made of this. Father John shared the lives of five people that were on his mind over the Christmas holiday in his midnight message. People were living lives of regret, lives that turned out oh so different than their youthful dreams for their lives. Five people longing painfully for the past, that time before they had made such a mess of things. And it's in that mess, in that destruction, that Israel, you and I, hear the prophet's message of hope. Rise up, rise in splendor, because it's the Lord's glory that shines on you. It is Jesus who's the light of the world who shines through the mess of your life and mine. We are all broken. And I know one of two things can happen. I can continue to live in my regrets. And I've been there and I've done that and that, brothers and sisters, is an It's an incredible, hopeless feeling. Living like that feels like a dead man walking to me. Or I can choose to accept the gift of mercy and forgiveness, the gift gift of hope that Jesus brings, offering me a fresh start. And there is nothing more exciting than a fresh start, especially as I get older. And that's why I love the sacrament of reconciliation. It's a fresh start. I, truth be told, I haven't always loved it. It wasn't easy. It's not easy bearing your soul, sharing your broken life with someone. It's not easy. I know that. But this I know. I know that his mercy heals me. I have two choices, dead man walking or allowing Jesus to raise me from that death by his incredible, endless mercy. In his homily in March of 2013, Pope Francis said this, he said, it is not easy to entrust oneself to God's mercy because it is beyond our comprehension. But we must. It is not easy, but we must, or we are just dead people walking. Hope, through God's mercy, is life for me. And more than that, it's life for others, because if he can do this in my life, he can do this in your life. Not only do I receive life-giving hope, I become a great messenger of hope. I become like a Christmas billboard. The epiphany and the baptism of our Lord, which we celebrate tomorrow, brings a close to this Christmas season. And this week, Jeannie and I, along with I'm sure many of you, will start to take down our tree, decorations, and pack away our crush. And this, this is the manger part of the crush. This is the food box, the food trough, and the little the statuette of baby Jesus. Um, this year, Jeannie and I have decided that we're not going to pack this away. We're going to keep this out. 
and keep it in our living room, our kitchen. We're going to move it around the house to be a constant reminder that Jesus came in that place. And he wants you and me, mess and all. That messed up part of our lives, I believe in my heart, is the greatest gift that we can offer our Lord Jesus. Which brings me to the final and obvious Christmas and Epiphany theme. It's a season of exchanging gifts. It's a tradition that comes from the scene in today's gospel. This holy exchange of gifts. The greatest gift to the world. The one who is gift is given gold. It's a gift of kings. It's given frankincense. It's incense to acknowledge his divinity. He's given myrrh, which is used in the embalming process. A gift for his suffering and death from which the Father's mercy flows. In a few minutes, we'll approach this altar to receive the greatest gift of Jesus himself in the Eucharist. And the Magi brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What gift do we bring? What gift do we bring? Like I said, I believe the greatest gift we can offer Jesus is our brokenness. Why do I say that? Because it's such an it's such a beautiful gift of faith. It's a gift that honors Jesus for who he is and what he does, just like the magi. When we bring those areas of our lives and hold nothing back, no matter how messy, we honor Jesus' kingship over every part of our life. We honor his divinity and his suffering, death, and resurrection. We place our broken lives on the altar, believing he redeems and transforms them because of who he is and what he's done. We believe it just like we believe that he transforms the bread and wine into into his very body and blood. Our offering is a gift of faith, and I believe that it pleases the Father. Our lives offered on this altar is incense. It is a sweet oblation. In a few minutes, the offertory will begin. And today and every time we come, let us bring our brokenness, our greatest gift. That gift that honors Jesus for who he is and what he's done. It honors his power, his divinity. It allows his mercy to shine through us as a gift and an offering of hope to the world. Let us prepare a sweet, sweet oblation to our God.